I do, I've tried several different rigs and it's it's done. I don't leave home without duct tape. No parents is hard to break. Yep. <laughs> Okay, everybody, make sure you sign in. It's super important that you signed in. If you didn't, the clipboard's coming around. If there's an emergency, there's two exits here. We meet up at the top of the hill. Hopefully that won't happen. The next meeting here is August 24th. Save that date. For those of you here who have not had Smith System training, May 18th. Saturday, that's a Saturday morning at 8 o'clock, so if you haven't had Smith System, I'll be reminding you at least two, three weeks in advance. It's about six and a half hours to do that. Today we should be out of here by 9.30, 9.40. We're going to take a 10-minute break at 9 o'clock. That is providing there's not an overwhelming amount of questions. So the original presentation only took about an hour and 10 minutes, but because of all the Omnitracks things that have changed in the past two weeks, I slapped another 10 slides on the end of it, so hopefully we'll get right through it. Uh, this is when we normally do our annual drug-free workplace training, so we had a speaker, um, and you get me this time. You don't get the hour spiel that we get in all the Ohio locations. We have to do that as part of our workers' compensation program. General updates, our safety goals, uh, Smith System Refresher, let me just say there's a lot of people messing around with their phones and we've had a couple of near misses. Please don't. Put the phone away. Uh, talk about maintenance with regards to the Omni tracks and uh, jump starting the trucks, turning the power off, low voltage, that kind of thing. Business update with Roger. Um, and we got a quick quiz at the end. And one of the things I want to try to do moving forward is rehash a little, a little bit of what we did the time before and see if anybody remembers. Does anybody, can anybody tell me what the PPEs you're supposed to have on? What are you supposed to have on when you're loading? Hard hats, safety glasses, reflective vest, hard toe shoes. And long pants and a long shirt, right? Long shirt, sleeve. Yeah. I guess I should put a plus one on that. Wear gloves. Thought that was... Pretty common. Don't don't touch steel or work on steel without gloves on, please. Driver of the Court Rewards. Safety goals, uh, reduce backing by 10%. We tried for that last year. We only had to reduce by one. We had 11 the previous year. We needed to get to 10. We made it to the last 20 days, and we had another one, so fail. We had 11 again. Okay, so we're going to try for that again. Reduce injuries by 10%. Down here, we've talked about it. Think before you step. Super important, guys. Before you grab onto a chain, before you make a move with your feet, before you make a move with your hands, think before you do everything, okay? You guys down here are like the injury winners, all right? That's a bad category to be in. I know a lot of it is from hurrying. I know that from experience. Slow down. If you get hurt, it's just like having an accident. You just made your day longer, right? You're not shortening anything up by hurrying. Hurry up and mess up. That's what my dad used to say. OSHA markings completed for the shop. Uh, I did get some floor tape at the Safety Congress they had this year in Columbus to test out that we can run over for a while and see how it works. But they say it's a lot better than paint and you don't have to mess with it and you can pressure wash it. So we're going to get the floor markings done, have a driver area boxed off. Um, and again, just as a reminder, drivers should not be in the shop unless you're bringing a truck in or out. Okay, you shouldn't be out here. That's so you don't get hurt. We're going to maintain the Smith system. The bulk of people is between here and Springfield. We added a bunch of guys on up at Springfield, so we're going to knock that out in May. And the other terminals that have one, two people, I'm going to try to do them over the summer also. Great job on securement. We're going to maintain our current routine and improve the number of cargo slides. Just saying that's great because if we're only having slides, we're not throwing the metal out on the road, right? We're keeping it on the truck. That's a, a major improvement. 
the drug-free workplace program. Um, I'm sure everybody knows there's an epidemic that continues for opioid use. The statistics are really skewed. They said that de deaths in Ohio dropped by 39%. I just pulled up the most recent statistics. That's most likely because everybody has Narcan now. You can go get it as a private citizen, the police, the fire. Everyone has Narcan, which if you're not familiar with that, they give you a shot and it saves your life if you overdose. 1,415 deaths, that was down from 1,800 and something, but you know how many lives were saved with Narcan? Multi some of them multiple times. We do have resources available through our health care provider, um, mental health, um, alcohol or drug addiction. Maybe not you, maybe one of your kids, maybe somebody you know. Um, anything you say to Melissa and HR or myself with regards to something like that is absolutely confidential. And I'll tell you, there was a few people last year that we helped, not necessarily with them, um, with their, their loved ones, their kids. Uh, it is very men mentally straining to have somebody in your loop, um, your kid's friend that's, that's got trouble. One of the biggest problems last year was there was not a place to put you if you had an addiction. There was not a bed to put you in. There was not a treatment program. And they've really corrected that you know, throughout all the states, there's a lot more facilities and resources available. So, um, makes me feel good to be able to help somebody out on a personal level and uh, we can point you in the right direction. Recent alarming trend is to add fentanyl, which we've talked about before, 80 to 100 times stronger than morphine to weed. So people that think that they're uh, just buying a bag of weed and smoke it, bang, they're dead. What's the problem with that? cops or the fire show up, they don't know what's wrong with you. They ask your buddy, hey, what happened to this guy? I don't know, he just smoked weed. By the time they figure out it's an opioid addiction, too late for Narcan and you're dead. So that even gets more convoluted because so many states have legalized medical and uh, recreational marijuana that, you know, the trend on the street is you go get your, your medical card so you can buy weed and then you never buy it from a dispensary again. You're buying all your weed on the street because it's cheaper, right? Until you get some with fentanyl in it and you're dead, then it wasn't cheaper anymore, okay? So if you know somebody that's in that loop, make sure they're aware of it. It's a, a very dangerous thing to be messing with fentanyl. That's the stuff for elephants and rhinoceroses to knock them out at the zoo. Somebody tell me when we have to wear our PPE. Anytime outside the truck while working. Yep, that's one of them. And it encompasses the other two when you're loading or unloading, right? Yeah. And the reason we say when you're outside the truck is because if you're in a mill, any facility loading, a lot of them have cracked the whip over the past couple of years. You got to have it on before you get out of the cab. Important to have your PPE on before you get out of the cab. Even though we've done all this talk, we just got caught, uh, and I felt he was a new driver. He. Um, Loaded his truck, had all his PPE on. He generally does things the right way. He was walking from his truck to the office to get his paperwork. His glasses fogged up when he came outside. Took them off, got them on camera, bang. Had to do a corrective action. Whole bunch of time. Before exiting the cab, okay? Anytime you're on a trailer, you should have your PPE on. Again, when you're on a trailer, when you're on the ground, look before you move your feet. Use your head all the time. Stop being in so much of a, a hurry. Don't ever run. Walk. Corrective action. We had to do a corrective action for the safety glasses, and then we had to do one for riding on, on the outside of a vehicle. Biggest thing is down at the bottom there, we look stupid. We look stupid when our customer reports to us that we're doing dumb stuff. So it's never acceptable to ride on the outside of a vehicle, not a forklift, a bobtail, the yard dog, the, bo uh, the bobcat. You can't ride on the outside of a vehicle ever, okay? Corrective actions, we've talked about them before. I don't want to beat it to death. When this happens, I got to make a bunch of paperwork. Melissa has to make a bunch of paperwork. Roger has to sign off on it. It goes to the Global ISO Committee. They approve it. In 30 days, I have to go back to all those same people that were involved, wherever the incident happened, get <coughs> approval that nothing else happened, and close it out. It's not like typing up two pages. It wastes probably 15 man hours to do a corrective action because we rode on the outside of a vehicle. Okay? But again, pride. You gotta have pride in what you do. Think about what you're doing. Is this the right thing to do? 
medical routing slips and chain of custody forms. <coughs> Having a lot of problems with drug testing last year, we had 13 errors. Most of them weren't ours, but the government says even if it's not ours, we have to do everything in our power to fix them. Can anybody tell me what this form is? You guys are good. You guys are good. I was surprised by the number of people that couldn't say that's a chain of custody. All right? So the terminal managers and the drivers should know what forms to have and when to ask questions. DOT chain of custody, how do we know that? Right up here at the top, it says a federal drug testing custody and control form, commonly referred to by a nurse or a doctor as a CCF, okay? This blue one says Roger Bettis trucking at the corner. This federal one says green lines. As drivers, if we're involved in a DOT reportable accident, we take a federal regulated drug test. For workers' compensation or office employees or non-CDL employees, if we get injured on the job, we're taking a non-DOT test. These are the ones that are screwed up the most frequently. So anybody that's been injured down here knows you're going to have to go take this test. So <clears throat> this has been ongoing for three years, and I finally determined that I can't fix the nurses and doctors. I can't fix the clinics. So last year we got these CCFs out to everybody. And when I send the random notifications out now, I'm actually sending the medical routing slip with the randoms and the terminal managers are printing them out off my email. And that way, if there's a mistake, who, whose mistake is it? It's mine, I own it, now I own it. I don't wanna do that paperwork. I liked having the terminal managers help me out. I got enough boxes to check as it is, but we were having too many errors. So now it's, I own it if there's a problem. So it's not all the clinics. I gotta say down here, we got, <coughs> we got some mistakes at the clinics here. Not your guy's fault. So when you're instructed, depending on where you go, we may ask you to take a chain of custody form with you. So if I tell you to take a chain of custody, no matter whether it's non-DOT or DOT, the important thing is you're the captain of the ship, you're the person at the clinic, they are to use no other paperwork other than the paper you bring because I've determined they're too dumb to use the right paperwork. That's the short story, okay? So I'm just gonna give you the paperwork. That's, that's the best I can do. There's no more areas for me to correct uh, as far as that goes. Then it's up to the doctors. Is there any questions on the chain of custodies? So a DOT reportable accident, we don't have hardly any of those. Then you would use a DOT chain. If it's a random, it's a DOT chain. The only time a driver is going to use the blue form, and I intentionally had them a different color, Roger Bettis trucking, not green lines, is if you're injured on the job. Okay? It's pretty simple. We'll get it straightened out this year. Medical research with a physical. Can you drive if your physical expires? No. And I never thought it would happen here. I mean, we've never had this happen up until January of this year. And what happened is, driver's physical expired on Thursday. He loaded on Wednesday. He was like 340 miles away. We figured he'd be back on Thursday. So the dispatch screen alerts the dispatcher if you're close to being out of time on your physical or your driver's license. No problem, this guy will be here Thursday, he'll go do his med research on Friday, no big deal. Well, for whatever reason, whether he broke down or he was slacking, he didn't show up till Friday. Well, if your physical expires on the 28th and you drive in on the 29th, is that a problem? Yes. Yeah, what's got to happen? i got to come pick you up, right? Right. I will come pick you up, please. For 13 grand, I can afford to come pick you up because that's what the fine is. All right? So uh, there's no way to, to make that go away. Once there's a gap in physical dates, your physical can never expire before the next one comes along. There can't be a gap. If there's a gap, I have to remove you from safety sensitive function in writing, okay? So don't let your physical run out. So what did I do to fix this? Everybody in McLeod now, moving forward, when you get a physical, if it expires on the 20th, I post it at the 17th. So there's no way, we don't get any farther than three days away from any terminal here. So now there's no way that you could actually dispatch and get back three days later and have it run out. So make sure that you don't drive if your medical ran out. Equipment tracking sheets and miles without hours. Um, 
This is an important thing to understand. This has been going on for three years. And I haven't really policed it too hard, but we're coming up on the deadline for ELDs. Can anybody what, tell me what ELD stands for? Electric Onboard Diagnostic. Nope. <laughs> Another guess. ELD. Electric Logging Device. Another guess. First word's electronic. Electronic Logging Device. Winner. Okay. Can anybody tell me what AOBRD stands for or AOBR? Automatic onboard recorder. Winner. All right. So I'm going to send this sheet around. Every shop has these. This does really apply a lot down here because of the traffic coordinators. Okay. Every time an equipment moves, how many miles does our company have to track? All miles. Every mile a truck moves. Okay. So rather than waste everybody's time logging in and out of every truck, they move 10 feet, pulling them in for a PM, going up to load. We just said, we're going to fill this sheet out. Because I've tried this at three different carriers, having guys <coughs> log in. It kills the maintenance people. It kills guys that are loading loads. It's too much time. So all you got to do is simply tell me who drove the truck, the date and the time. That's it. Load. All I need to know. Jeff Plies removed the truck. JK, this date, truck number. PM. That's all I got to know. What does this do every day? Anna pulls a report. Anna helps me do the hours of service that shows all of the vehicles without login movement or miles without hours. What's that mean when you move 10 feet in the truck when you were in the bunk? Miles without hours or login. Yup, it shows up on our, our end every time. If you thought you were sneaking, you weren't really. Okay. So then we have to assign the miles back to that person or assign them to a vendor when a vendor drives the truck. This sheet's very important moving forward. It's supposed to be filled out by the traffic coordinators and the maintenance department and be emailed to Ann and myself every single day. Coming up between now and December, we will be policing this more heavily. We had bigger fish to fry. I'm gonna send this around just so everybody can look at it and see what we're trying to do. All I need to know is the truck and who drove it and why. That's it. Doesn't have to be a novel. Load, PM, whatever. Um, Every single day, that has to come to our end. Email to Anna and myself. The reason is, Anna's looking at 22 of them, probably 15 of them are maintenance. What are the other seven? Guys sneaking, okay? Guys sneaking around. You're going to get the miles. You probably don't even know. You will when we get switched to ELDs. You'll know we assigned it back to you. <coughs> Accident scenes, photos, and time management. So I'd like to give you guys a, a round of applause. You guys down here, everyone does an excellent job reporting accidents. The most minor thing. So I, I always try to make this point very recently here. In the last three weeks, I had an accident where a driver backed up and tapped a car. When he looked in his mirror, he saw a car, but he didn't see the one that was right up on his bumper. Neither car had a scratch on it. And the driver stated, I quote, no damage. There was two occupants in each of the other vehicles, okay? No damage, that's what I was told. Right now I've paid out 15,500 and I haven't started the bodily injury claims. Why? There's certain things I can tell in that first seven minutes that are so critical. If you hit a Nissan, there's a couple people here that know about Nissans. What happens to a Nissan when you hit it? I'm not gonna point any fingers. If you touch a Nissan, they're, they're total. All you got to do is go like this, and they're total. They're made out of crushed up cigarette packs, okay? <laughs> that's how. That's the truth. You touch a Nissan, we're buying it. I'd rather hit you a Mercedes-Benz because we're only going to buy a Fender, all right? You touch a Nissan, it's junk. You hit the front of a Subaru or a Toyota, right away, $10,000, $12,000, because all the artificial intelligence stuff is in the front bumper of the vehicle. What controls the camera angles and the sensitivity, so... What you think is no damage and what I think is no damage, I promise you, they're two different things. The guy that told me no damage, I go, 20 grand. He goes, no, man, there's not even a scratch on it. I go, you mark my words, it'll be 20 grand. And I'm coming pretty close to being right. I am I love guessing at estimates. Jeff and I have this game, and we had that uh, truck down here that got sideswiped by another truck. And the very first thing I said at that accident scene was this guy's going to have no insurance and no authority, and we're going to eat this. 
and I guessed at 12.5, yeah. and it's the farthest I've been off in three years. It come in at 23,000 or something like that, right? Yeah. Probably Most of the time, I'm within a couple thousand bucks of guessing what's what's going to happen. So we're going to eat that. The guy, but the driver did an awesome job at the scene. We got pictures of the driver, pictures of the truck. You can't get blood from a rock, right? If they have no insurance and no authority, if they're outlaw trucking. You know, we're going to have to take them to court. If I spend a whole bunch of money to take them to court, am I going to get anything from a rock? No. Nope. Move on. It happens. It's trucking. So you must report an accident in the first 15 minutes. Does anybody in this room have a flip phone? Raise your hand. Can you take, <laughs> can you take a picture and send it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Is there... Every guy I've rode with has left at this thing. <laughs> I'll give you some credit. They are durable. Okay? That's why I got it. All right. Is there anybody here that does not know how to send a picture with their phone? I'm sorry. No. <laughs> no, you got them. You, oh, did you have the kids send them to me? Uh, somebody else. That's fine. You got it. You had it under control. I, I, took, the, I took the picture. Because you know what I tell guys as soon as they tell me they can't send a picture? I'm like, look around. You find somebody under 30, hand them your phone and tell them to send them this picture. <laughs> it works, man. It works. All I care is I get the picture. Do you have a... He's got a smartphone. You got an Android phone? Okay. So we're going to add on to this 15-minute thing. That first seven minutes is so critical. Why? <laughs> What happens after 10 minutes? Cops are there. Okay, you guys were paying attention the last time. Excellent. What happens after the cops get there? Scene's locked down. Can't talk to anybody. Yep, and they're going to tell you, sit in your truck, driver, right? That's exactly what they're going to tell you. So the critical seven minutes is that time when I can instruct you what to do, and I don't mean to sound rude or arrogant. That's not it. I'm trying to protect you. So everybody knows, probably most people in this room, what I'm going to do in that first seven minutes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say, you got your triangles out. Are you okay? Yep, got your four ways on. Get out, I want you to take three pictures. I want you to take a picture of their driver's license and their insurance card, okay? And I want you to take a picture of their vehicle that shows the license plate. Right now, the only thing I'm lacking for information is their phone number. Call me back as soon as you've sent those pictures. We're at four minutes. I'm like, okay, get out and take damaged pictures from 20 <laughs> feet away. This works excellent because it's only a single task at a time. And you think that drivers don't melt down at accident scenes, they do. Probably at least 50% of the time. They get very nervous. You guys get nervous. It's my job to not be nervous, to keep you calm, and still get the information we need. And again, you guys really do an excellent job here. The most important thing is just do what I tell you to do and not think about it, because we, we only got seven minutes to play with. After that, if we get all our information, we can call it into the insurance, we can get people to the scene, we can do everything we gotta do. So firsthand, we had two bad examples of what happened uh, with accidents of equal cost. When that ice storm hit, and I can't remember the date now, I can't even remember the month, but it was about three or four days when everything was ice, we had two trucks that were both, uh, one was on like 270 around um, Columbus. Columbus, and the other one was in Cincinnati both of them on the outer loop. They both had vehicles strike them on the right-hand side at highway speed, strike the cab, like by the fuel tank area, okay? The one of them, the first one was two other vehicles and the second one was three other vehicles that spun out of control and crashed and whatever. Both those drivers had flip phones. Both those drivers did not have the ability to take pictures. One of those drivers listened to my instructions. There was a whole bunch of people stopped in both these accidents, extra people. I'm like, is there anybody there under the He's like, yup. I'm like, can you take a picture with the phone? He's like, yup. I'm like, give your phone to that kid and have him send me pictures. If he can't send them with your phone, tell him I'll give him 20 bucks to send them with his phone. So he actually figured out how to send pictures with a guy's flip phone, and I got him. The other driver, who I really don't know what happened, other than he was probably in shock, um, People that struck us were both over 80 years old. They were en route to the hospital for some routine diagnostics. We were on a city, uh, you know, going through the city, and uh, he just didn't get things done. 10, 12 minutes passed, and I got no pictures, I got no information, no names, so we had to send somebody to the accident scene who recovered the information and got me photos right away, and I'm like, this is a problem. Now the cops are on the scene. So the short story is, 
the second guy who followed my instructions and got me the information, the pictures in that first seven minutes before the cops showed up, incidentally, he owned the truck. Doesn't matter. Roger wants his money. I want my money if I'm an owner operator. Either way, we want to get our money back, right? Standard's going to be 60, 90 days if you're lucky. The number two guy that followed my instructions, I had him a check for $9,900 in just under four weeks. The other guy, who incidentally was an owner operator, okay, didn't get his money for about 13 weeks or something like that, and he jumped up and down and called me everything but a good citizen. Um, every single week torturing me and I'm, I finally said to him, I said, hey look, you're the one that botched the accident scene. It's not my fault. I got nothing. To, I can't make claims happen out of thin air. I don't know who's driving, who hit you, their license plate number. I got no pictures of the number two vehicle. Yeah, let's get a claim processed on that. We're lucky we got a dime at all, right? So <clears throat> the difference with that critical seven is getting the right information. The claim is processed faster. There's less hassle. If I can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it's your fault, I'm going to get the money. The insurance company is just going to pay. Otherwise, I'm going to have to fight. In an accident, <coughs> whose burden of proof is it to prove that it was the other guy's fault? It's ours. It's kind of backwards in the judicial system. We have to prove that it's your fault. So it, it's a tough, I do a lot of fighting, arguing with claimants to get our money back. That first seven minutes is critical. Um, nice job by you guys doing that. Keep up the good work. And my same, I'll, I say this in public in front of everybody, if it's some little, you know, $18 thing, $82 tarp patch, I'm just gonna code it as an incident and make it go away. I'm not gonna do a giant amount of paperwork. I try to be really fair about that. You know, if it costs $1,000, obviously I'm gonna write it up as an accident, right? But if it's some little thing, I'm very thankful that you took the time to stop and call me and we're just going to move on. Injury reporting must be done within the first 15 minutes. Injury reporting must be done in the first 15 minutes. If you get hurt at work, you have to call HR or safety. Melissa Maple is extension 209. I am extension 203. Everyone knows that my phone is on 24 hours a day. I have missed a few calls recently only because there's been so many calls that I couldn't call them back, and I apologize. Secondary contact would be a terminal manager. <coughs> that is one thing that makes me crazy at an accident scene is when they're like, I called the terminal manager and he told me to call you. We just burn up about five minutes. Now we're down to two minutes, right? Now I'm going to just try to get the most critical information. All right. Same thing with an injury. If you're out here laying in the parking lot bleeding to death, and I know there's another driver that could put a Band-Aid on you right next door, don't burn up five minutes calling Kevin, call me, I'm the one that's gonna send you to get it fixed, right? And that does happen. We just had that happen not too long ago here. I was looking for the, the Band-Aid participant, I don't see him. At any rate, uh, it's a good thing. A couple guys got first aid kits in their truck. Thank you for doing that. Sometimes a Band-Aid or some glue will really help out. Duct tape works well, too, speaking of duct tape. You can fix a curtain side or your finger with duct tape. Make sure your injury is reported within the first 15 minutes. Bolster poles, they're not invisible. Everybody know what a bolster pole is? Yellow poles? Uh, mm -hmm. I've run a few of them over. I have. I've run over some light poles too. So I got a Steve Ryan rule number 1325A, do not park next to poles. Because when I wake up, I turn right and run them over. That's how I do it, okay? <laughs> I did about 25 grand damage to a tractor one time running a bolster pole over. Okay, it's, it can get expensive. They don't move. You can run them over with a big truck and they will not move. They will bend when they tear your steer axle and your fuel tank <laughs> off, but they will not move. And it's about 1500 bucks to put one of them in too, okay? Clean your mirrors before you back. Get out and look. Get out more than once. That's very important. Get out more than once. All right? If you get out of the cab for any reason, you go in and check in, what way should you come around the truck? The long way. The long way. You start the passenger door, come all the way around. Why do we do that? To make sure our path is clear, right? There's nobody behind us. Do we ever, in any circumstance, back up in traffic? No. That was the no damage claim, just so you know. He backed up about this far, all right? 
The problem was it was 5 a.m. Car was right on his bumper. I mean like inches away when he pulled into the turn lane to turn. The second car was now one car length back. So when he looked in both mirrors, he's seeing car number two. Put it in reverse, went this far, boom, boom. 20 grand later, here we are. I will pay you to drive 500 miles around the block. Please continue forward, get on the highway, whatever you gotta do, go to China and come back, okay? Do not back up in traffic ever. I'm not worried about driving 100 miles. To, I've been, I've driven a long ways. You know, places like Philadelphia, you can't turn around. You're going the other side of town. It's a long ways. It's aggravating. Don't back up in traffic. Fraudulent claims. Boy, I was hoping to never have to talk about this. <coughs> Recently, we've had two fraudulent claims. Now I got to think. One of them's here. And the other one, are both of them here? Both of them here. Both of them are here. It's not going good. So the first one, the driver backed into a dock, pulled out of the dock. There was a rat wagon truck next to him. I mean, this was a real rat wagon. Hood's all mashed up. The bumper's been back and forth three times. I wouldn't give you 1500 bucks for this Peterbilt just looking at it. I mean, completely trashed. The corner's all smashed off of it. He pulls out uh, of the line of traffic. They were lined up to go into a place. When he pulls out and backs into the dock, the other driver comes up and says he hit the truck. All right? So, uh, fraud groups work together. People that do fraudulent claims, they're smart. They know what to do. Call the cops. Now you got a police report. Take a million pictures. Get the plant safety people up. Lock this thing down so that Steve, the other driver, is proven guilty whether he is or not, right? So now the burden of proof is on us. So what are we doing to combat that particular one? We took the trailer and we measured every single point to the inch where it could have collided with the hood. Um, and the driver's here, and he doesn't know this yet, but about three days ago I found out that the measurements are off about three inches. So we are going to deny the claim. Where the strikes were on the grill of the truck, first of all, it's aluminum and you can see they're old. They're not shiny. But we can, we can definitively determine that there's no way our vehicle could have struck the front of that hood. <clears throat> so then the, the other thing you need to understand is insurance groups, a lot of them, are members of um, an arbitration group. And if you're in an arbitration group, even if you can prove that it's not your fault, if the other side won't agree, they have like a contract between them that says, you're in our arbitration group, we're going to go fight this out at arbitration. We could still end up paying part of that claim. We won't pay the whole thing and we have denied the claim. So if you pull into an area, pull in the line, you're going to go back into a dock and there's a truck that looks like it's worth $6, what should you do? What can you do to protect yourself? Pictures. Number one, don't park next to them. Take pictures. Pictures are where it's at. Technology is where it's at. You can't dispute a picture because there's a timestamp on it. You pull, I'm driving across the dock like this and you got a crap truck, I'm going to go click, gotcha. That proves your truck was junk before I backed in next to it, okay? So the next one, another truck backed in, was parallel parking next to us when our guy was sleeping and basically tore the side off of our truck. As soon as I saw it, that's the one that I guessed at $12,500 and it came in at $23,000. And I tortured the poor driver. <coughs> and he, was, he had already been up 14 hours and we stayed up together till I think 1.40 in the morning because I knew when I saw this truck, no markings, no DOT numbers, um, difficulty communicating with the other driver. And what? Well, he stayed there. No, it's partner. Oh, that's the third one. Yeah. That's the third one. That hadn't happened when I did this. But the most recent one that was down here was, was the parallel parking one. Um, so we have chased down the owner of the vehicle. Guess what the owner said? That driver doesn't work for me. 
The driver's name, which I probably shouldn't say, was Robert Lee Jones, which I thought was kind of ironic. <laughs> Second clue was the owner's name was Linda Lee. Think that's a real person? I don't. I think it's, I think it's horse hockey, and I think it's outlaw trucking, and I knew right away we we're going to have trouble. So the bottom line is, uh, probably no authority. They do show registered. They show one truck. Another clue right there at the accident scene. I, I quick typed into Safer and looked at this company's name. For the calendar year 2016, they showed one mile. Okay. Then I just Googled it. I Googled the name of the trucking company. Multiple lawsuits came up trying to sort for accidents. So I know we're not going to get our money. So that's when I had the driver. I'm like, hey, man, just do a drive-by on the guy's face. Click. I want a picture of the guy that ran into us because we could go after him. Did what? Videos are hard to present in court. Still photos are better. You could take a short video, but if you make them too big, they're tough to deal with. I mean, you can edit them but still photos are best. So, oh, you're talking on the cab camera. Yes, you can do that. You can hit that multiple times. Very good point, Jeremy. Every time you hit it, it's going four seconds forward and eight seconds back. Um, but there was no footage on that accident, and the reason was it was a glance. Our truck's parked like this. It was a glancing blow. And it went back and just took the, you guys have probably seen the truck. I mean, it messed up the bunk. Brand new truck, 100,000 miles on it. So, the third incident, which I almost forgot about, um, and what was that? Who, fill me in. I've had so many accidents, I don't remember. Well, what happened was we were going through South Carolina, supposedly oh, yeah. Spartanburg, and uh, we had a report, somebody called in on us, that we had a hit and run. So, Steve, you can go on, you know. So I, I said, okay, well, we have GPS tracking on our trucks. And there's a couple critical questions I ask. I call them Richie Hawthorne questions, because I knew this fellow that I drove truck with, Richie Hawthorne. He never asked you a question that he did not know the answer to. So I call him Richie Hawthorne questions. So I'm going to ask this person, when you say that my truck hit you, I'm going to ask you some Richie Hawthorne questions. And hopefully you're going to fall into the trap and get your foot caught. First question, I'm like, okay, ma'am, I said, uh, do you have a picture of the truck? Nope, I have no picture, no video. Woo woo, awesome. Second question, what's the second thing I'm gonna ask him? What company is the truck? What company, because everybody mistakes us for the green lines that's out of California that's a bunch of wahoos. They run reefers, so I ask them, hey, was it a white dry van? And if they say yes, gotcha. I'm out, I'm free, right? But unfortunately, they, they were able to say no, it was one of those black canvas trailers. No unit numbers. That's the next thing I ask, unit numbers. They had a plate number. Plate numbers I can dispute in court. I can drive out here and get a plate number and say, hey, he ran me over. He ran me over. I get a plate number any time I want it. That's how fraud loops work, just so you know. They pick a truck where the driver's not paying attention. He's eating a Whopper. He's talking on his phone. He just hit the zipper. He's had his turn signal on for left mile. Bingo. That's my next $25,000 lawsuit. Okay? So... <clears throat> I said, I said, you know what? So let me look at this. The nearest truck we had was 105 miles away. So the next Richie Hawthorne question I asked, I said, ma'am, what time did this accident happen? And she said, 1043 or something. Well, at 1043, my nearest truck was 105 miles away. It was a whole bunch of trucks that went through Spartanburg that day. I think, honestly, she had the time wrong. Two things, either it's a scam or she had the time wrong. Very possible we could have been going through Spartanburg at that time. But according to what she said, it wasn't me. And I can only go by what you're telling me if you say I hit you, right? So what am I going to do with that claim? Denied. denied. Claim denied. You told me you didn't have a picture. You told me you didn't have a unit number. You told me that uh, it was just a black tarpy trailer, okay? Very, very important to pay attention to the vehicles around you. So where am I going with all this? I am going to pay attention to the vehicles around you. If you see a smashed up vehicle that the whole left side is mashed up, take a note of the plate number. Maybe take a picture. I hate to tell a guy to use a phone when you're driving, but geez, if you think somebody looks suspicious, they're hanging right there with you for an hour and the whole side of their car is mashed up, maybe snap a picture. Maybe hit the buttons on the camera. 
okay? It's really, you have to posture yourself nowadays to protect yourself. That's all there is to it. So, I think you guys probably remember, I had that happen to me in Howell, Michigan, about 10 years ago. A lady alleged that I backed out of a dealership, struck her vehicle, tore the whole side off her car. I had the owner and his son backing me out. I had no cars on the bottom of my trailer, so I had clear vision. There was a light to the, my left. So when the light turned red, the owner and his kids stepped out in the street, and I blindsided out into the road. But of course, I'm in a car hauler. I can see out the back window. There was no vehicle. <laughs> so the simple deciding factor to shorten the story was, I'm backing out like this. This car goes by me like this. I would have had to obstruct the right side of that vehicle, right? If I did hit you, it's yeah. possible to run stuff up. Well, let's just say I did some unethical things and I found her address and I went and looked at the car. Guess which side was damaged? I was a truck driver at that time, so I could do that stuff. Left side was tore off. Turns out she was having a relationship with a sheriff's officer. In fact, the one that came to my accident scene and they crashed the car in a mall parking lot. The other thing they did that was really bad is they took it to the Ford dealership that I was delivering to three weeks earlier and said they had deer damage. And the owner said, you know, I think I remember this lady when I told him the name. And he pulled it up and sure as heck, he had a work order for deer damage to the left side of that vehicle. And now I got a picture of the car. I got arrested and incarcerated in Howell, Michigan. Detroit, Detroit police picked me up in the yard of the company I was working for and I got incarcerated for it. Why? Because it's a felony to leave the scene of an accident in a commercial motor vehicle. In Michigan, don't mess around. They just come get you and locked up. It was a bad situation, guys, but I, I'm trying to give you an example of what you're up against. There's people that are looking to take you for a ride. And unfortunately, that makes number three, I'm glad you remember that, in a very short window here. Why the weather's warming up, it's getting nice. Be on your toes, take pictures, pay attention to what's going on around you. Most importantly, think before you move your feet. The chances of fraud or getting hurt, I'd say your chances of getting hurt are worse. So think before you move around. Trainers, I promised that I was gonna redo the training documentation. Thank everybody that does training for me. Has anybody here used the new training documents? You can take a look at these. Basically, I shortened it up to five pages. It used to be 40 pages, 40, 50 pages when a guy got done. And now it's only five pages. There's one line for each day, your total hours you worked, the load you hauled. One thing I did see is that people were putting down, they hauled steel. Yeah, I, I know we hauled steel. Okay. <laughs> what I'm looking for there is coil, sheet stock, round stock, that kind of thing. Just a couple more clues. I tried to, tried to switch it down so that it's easier for you. So the very last page of that, I used to have to have send all the training documentation in, print your logs, tally up the hours, and then I would issue a certificate. Now the last page of that is the certificate. It says certificate of training, because the government says I gotta do that. So before that gets sent back, you gotta print and sign, the trainee's gotta print and sign, and I gotta sign it, and that's your certificate. So basically, once the guy's done and you send me that packet done, we're done. That probably saved between you and me 15, 20 hours. It was the paperwork was just too much. So there's a page in there that's got a whole bunch of different items that used to be on four or five pages, like talking about the Smith system, talking about stale green lights. If you do it, you initial and he initials. If you don't do it, don't do it. Don't say we did something we didn't do, because I, I need to document what we did to train. <laughs> so we talked about this the last time, and I'm going to keep pounding home. Every person that works here will have 40 hours of ELD and securement training. I don't care if you've been driving 100 years, you're going to get 40 documented hours. How do I document that? Logs. Your log. What kind of log? Electronic log. If you're not logged in, does it count? Nope. We do have to teach some guys how to do paper logs, but the way we document our training, our policy says that we do it on electronic logs. So what happens sometimes is, um, not down here usually, but at other places, and just so you're aware of it, they'll be like, oh, I couldn't get the training logged in, so we just took off. Don't do that, please wake me up, and I'll fix this log in. Because that means he's going to have to train in a whole other day. That day doesn't count, okay? If it's a driver that needs to be trained on paper logs, then we're going to do some paper logs in conjunction with the electronic logs. 
but really I just wanted to make this easier for you guys. So every driver gets 400 drivers with less than two years experience um, or <coughs> two years experience of flatbed will have 200 hours. All right. Now if you've been driving for 10 years and you don't have any flatbed, I might let you go early, but we're probably going to shoot for 160 hours. So these are all above and beyond. And, and I'm going to tell you why. Because all those seminars that Roger sends me to for the insurance company, they always got a lawyer telling, delivering the bad news. The first thing they said in Las Vegas this year was, burn your policy. That's what the first slide said. Burn, I want you to go home and burn your policy. You are better off having no policy if you don't follow the policy that you have. Okay? Which... I didn't explain this three years ago, but the reason I said 200 hours is because the first week I worked here, I read the book and it said 160 hours. So here's what happens. Mankind is what it is. And you're going to get terminal manager going to be, oh, come on, Steve, let this guy go. Let this guy go. He's good after three, three seconds. He's good. My answer is always like, okay, when the coil comes off and kills seven little kids in a minivan, you're going to own it, right? You're going to do the deposition. Usually we continue on for the week is how that conversation goes. So if I set the bar at 200 hours and we get to 161, I'm good, right? And what else did I do? Followed my policy. If you don't follow what you got in writing, you might as well burn it. You're better off not having one. So, <clears throat> and I really do want you to have that much. There is a, if I went out to drive flatbed right now, I haven't had a coil on the deck of a trailer in about probably 27, 28 years, I would make myself go ride with one of you guys for at least two weeks. I, I know how to chain stuff down. I can confidently put a load on a trailer, but there's so many things that are easy to forget. And if you forget something in this job, you get dead, right? So I'm not trying to you know overdo it. I'm trying to protect you and the motoring public. Must be logged in. Is there any questions on the training thing? If you have questions on that paperwork, if anybody trains, just call me. There's one line for each day. The certificate's at the end of it. I even wrote a little instruction page and uh, tried to make it uh, much simpler than it was. Hey, let, let's try this again. Hopefully nobody read that slide. What do you do if you forget to log off? Please somebody tell me because I've been going over this for three years. I know Roger knows the answer and he doesn't ever log in. So at some point, I drove at home. If you forget to log off and it's 3 a.m., what do you do? Well, you actually sign out of the EOD? Nope. Or just changing the uh, off duty? I mean, call you. You forgot to log off. Call okay, you. we call Steve. That's one option. What's the option so that Steve gets more sleep? <coughs> Take on off. Drive you. You do what? Come on now. Somebody's got to know. I'm not answering this one. You could edit it. That is another option. But say you want Steve to fix your log tomorrow, but you need to go trucking now. What do you do? Yeah, paper's the worst thing. I try not to make paper. Paper could be done. That's another option. But there's a very simple option we've been over many, many times. Awesome. That's the first step. What's the next thing you do? Drive. Yeah. Well, there's one thing you got to do before you drive. <coughs> What's that note say? Explain what Yep. So, what did you forget to do? No, uh, no. Sometimes it just fails to log off, but I got a comment in there that says, forgot to log off, just so you don't have to type it. So, what's the other remark you have to put in if you forgot to log off? One remark box is going to say, forgot to log off. We just determined that. What's the other box going to say? I'm waiting, man. I'm not giving up the answer. That's, that's going to be in there somewhere, too. Man, I'm glad we're not sitting on the edge of fate waiting to pull the trigger on the atomic bomb because we'd be doomed. <laughs> What's the other remark you got to put in? Forgot to log off. Date and time. You squeezed it out of me. I couldn't take the suspense anymore. Wow. You guys are killing me. 
And I'm not going to say it was somebody here, but it was somebody here. Didn't know how to log in the other day. Okay? Did not know how to log in. Is there anyone here that does not know how to log in? Raise your hand for public persecution. Okay? If you, for, if you need to log in, your username is your SCAT code. First three letters of your last name and the first two letters of your first name. So mine is R-Y-A-S-T. And the password is the last four of your social security number. How often should you log off? I do every day. At least once a week. For day cab drivers, yes, both those are correct. If you're a day cab driver, you should log off every day. Why? Because if Corey drives a truck, you're good to go. He's going to put those miles on that miles without hours sheet. Anna's going to get it, and she's going to go, oh, load. Those miles are not going to get assigned to Carnell. They're going to get assigned to a traffic coordinator. Yeah. Excellent. And once a week is correct, too. If you're a road driver, at least once a week. Why do we sign off? To update the computer or get it to... You got it. It clears your memory out. It clears your memory. Human mind can only remember seven things. MCP50s can only remember about two. Once you get two in there, unless you put them in the garbage can, it can't remember anymore. First thing I ask every driver that calls me and says, my computer is so slow it's making me crazy. When was the last time you logged off? Six months ago. Man, I have to say, in the past 10 days, I must have sent out at least five messages that said, make sure and log off daily. If you're a day cab driver, make sure and log off. Am I, am I going crazy? Did I not send those messages out? You stand oh, there. Did I? Did you guys see him? Yes. You did? Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a fellow in Northbrook. His computer kept freezing up. I re <laughs> mobile reset him with all this upgrade about 10 times. And finally, the other day, you know, I'm extremely fatigued and I'm like, Hey man, when was the last time you logged off? He's a day driver. He never is on the road overnight. He's done at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Well, last year sometime. I'm guessing that might be the problem. If you got 12 people in a Volkswagen, you're going to get 13? Nope. All right? The other thing that kills you is your messages. You can have 30 to 50 messages in there. It's not going to hamper you too much. If you're one of them guys that's got 9,000 messages, start deleting them because I can't delete them on the back end. Do 20 or 30 a day because it's slowing you down. If you are a person, is there anybody in here that's got more than 100 messages? Because I can call Omnitrax and have them small. You should. I mean, really, because it's really just adding so much time to your day. You have no idea how much it's slowing you down. If you got more than 100 messages, you should call me and I'll have Omnitrax smoke them off the back end. You can delete all the red messages at one time. Can you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They must change that. That's good. Forgot to log off, remark, forgot to log off. And then somebody in here said it, go off duty for two minutes. That way I can fix it in the morning when I get there and remark the date and time. Forgot to log off, 3.30.19 at 17.30, okay? You do tell everybody to use military time, it's real clear, leaves no question. My whole life I've told million dollar drivers to do this and I've had a whole bunch of them go through DOT checks and I've never had anyone get a ticket, why? Because every cop knows that you can't stay awake for 40 hours. If you didn't log off Friday and it's Monday, you were not awake that whole time, okay? Common sense. That's why. That's why they're not going to write you a ticket. I've never had them write a ticket. <coughs> now, if you're super nervous, and some of you guys get that award, go ahead and start a paper log, okay? But you can still put this remark in, and I guarantee that you won't get in trouble. If you do, I own it. Never had anybody get in trouble. Call me in the morning or edit it yourself. Important thing to know coming up the ELD deadline, you must know how to edit your log yourself. I'm not saying you have to do it, but you should maybe practice it a couple times. It's one of the things you're required to be able to do. Driver, do you know how to edit your log? Yes, sir. That's the correct answer, right? The correct answer is the most important answer. Driver, do you have a blank log book? Yes, sir. Driver, do you have your ELD manual? Yes, sir. Driver, can you show me your previous eight days? Yes, sir. Most of the time, they're not going to ask you to show them. Okay? It's having the correct answer. The three minutes, uh, I just started telling guys that. A lot of guys know it. But if you forgot to log off, and you come in at 2 o'clock in the morning, go off duty for two or three minutes, come back on. Forgot to log off, 3.30.19 at 17.30. Hit OK. You can add another remark for pre-trip. Go trucking. That way, when I come in, I can edit it. You can just leave a message with your name, truck number, edit my log. 
I can figure it out. If you just tell me edit your log, I can figure it out. Uh, it's pretty I easy. Got a question. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I keep forgetting. I meant to tell you about it, but more about. I was in a scale house a couple of weeks ago and uh, got a real friendly stuff. And I was asking him about the uh, weight allowance for uh, the ATUs and stuff, just uh -huh. to tape on it. And he said it's federal law. Like if we have those, if you should have there's a piece of paper that you can put in the truck that tells the weight of those. Yep. And it is. He said if they do not give you that allowance, and it's up to 600 pounds. And but you have, the, but if you have that paper, it states the weight of that whole unit, batteries and everything, uh -huh. they will give you that allowance over the 80,000 pounds. It should be in the truck. It comes with the APU unit. Well, but it, they said all you have to do, they said a lot of people won't check it. He said if you tell me you got one, he said whatever, but he said if you have that paper that up to 600 pounds, that you are allowed that allowance. And if are they, we, are if we they leaving that on the cab? It comes with the APU unit. We need to make sure everybody's got one. I don't know how many is in You're there. You're not supposed to make copies of it. It's supposed to be the one that came with the APU. We don't get one with it. We should request it from the manufacturer, well, like 100 of them. But they said, we'll they said if they don't give it to you, that they're breaking the law more so than you because it's federal law that states that you are. I know. Our, I, I know believe the law does say that you have to. You can't go back and fight one. You have to produce it at the time you get the citation. Yeah. And he said, he said, by law, they have to, it actually has to work. He said, but they never check them. He right. said, but if you have like somebody crazy, they'll get up there, but it actually has to function in order to get credit. But, but as long as you have that paper. That we will get on that and get, yeah. get them out to all the trucks. I they, need one for money. <laughs> You're currently number 2,742 in line. I'll get right on that. Okay, Jeffersonville fuel pump. Uh, you guys do go there because I get a lot of phone calls from you guys. They're not being able to get fuel. And Roger's like, man, this safety guy's an idiot because this Jeffersonville fuel pump's been messed up for three years and we haven't figured it out. Why? Finally figured it out. And I, I'm not so sharp, but I don't get the maximum village idiot award because it wasn't me, okay? I had everything done right. It is the only pump that will ask you to enter a second card number. When that happens, you put your truck number in. Not Joe Lewis's <coughs> birthday, not Clinton's last public speech date, not the mechanic's social security number. You put your truck number in when it says card number. It says enter second card number. It does not do it all the time on every transaction. It's a security feature of that particular pump, okay? So I couldn't figure out why this has been going wrong for three years. So I started asking some drivers in Jeffersonville at the last safety meeting, hey, when Billy comes in there, he gets fuel from Randleman, and he hasn't been here in 15 minutes. He says, what do I put in for the second card number? What do you put it, tell him to put in? Oh, well, last four years social. There was three drivers and one mechanic in Jeffersonville telling every foreign driver, and when I say foreign driver, I mean all the Randleman drivers, <laughs> in Jeffersonville to put their last four in. Well, if you swipe through your card three times, it locks you out. There's no one that can fix it but me or Kelsey. Swipe twice the pilot and once the fuel pump in the yard, you're locked out. Party's over, okay? So I'm like, well, how could this work? The fuel system's like a calculator. Truck, card, driver, gas. That's how it works. That's the math it does, okay? How could this work? All four of those people that were giving bad information, their social security numbers were a truck number in our fleet. What are the odds, man? <laughs> One of them that sticks with me was 1109, and that's a truck. So it would work, you know? But when he tells me to do that, and I put my last four of my social in, it doesn't work. Second card number in Jeffersonville, your truck. Anywhere three swipes and you're locked out, we really, it's been a, a, a long project for a few years to get all the old people and trucks and everything to lead it out of the fuel system. It's cleaned up. It works like it's supposed to. It has a lot of great security features in it. And uh, truck, driver, mileage, right? Go. Card number, go. Speaking of which, does everybody have Fleet One checks? Yes. yes, yes. Okay. Fleet One. Yes. EFS, WEX, it's still Fleet One. <laughs> All right, I'm going to send this stack around. Just grab two. So you got two extra? Make sure These were like truck. Make sure they're in your truck. Yeah. Take one and send them around. 
They were hard to get there for a while. Is there anybody that needs an insurance card? New insurance card, expired March. I you Take a minute to check your permits. Our permit books are the easiest permit books I've ever seen. Registration, IFTA, lease, annual vehicle inspection. If there ain't four things there, everybody can count four, right? If there ain't four things in your permit book, we got a problem. There's going to be five because we're going to get the APU letters. Yeah. It's supposed to be the original one for the manufacturer. And that's supposed to just help with gross weight. Not yeah, that's only gross weight. weight. It's 400 pounds on ours, yeah. on all ours. Yeah, I know that. I, I've, I've, seen, the, I've seen it before. <coughs> it goes up to 890 pounds depending on the unit. Yeah. But it has to be provided by the manufacturer. So we'll do that. That's a great, a great idea because I hate paying tickets. Is that all they allow with the batteries and everything? It's all they allow. Okay, the upgrade went well for Fleet One. Very little change for you guys. A lot of change for me and the mechanics and Kelsey. The software is a web-based thing. Um, I, I've been struggling with it. Some of the stuff, how to set up new drivers and new trucks, it's just like totally different on my end. And I, I have to call in for support, but I appreciate your, your patience. It's a disappointing Fleet One overall because they tried to go through this upgrade five times and ended up canceling. I had to cancel once. It was kind of a mess, but it happened. And it's done and over with. Th thank the good Lord. We're going to do Jeff. Um, before he starts, I want to say if your truck won't start, don't go work. When you do that, that's an $800 deal. It smokes the Omnitrax unit. Your starter's drawing 30 to 60 amps. These can't take it, okay? They cannot take it. It burns up the board. 800 bucks a crack. Don't crank if it's dead. If you're jumping it, let it charge before you crank it. Don't wait two and a half minutes and go, because you're going to burn that up. You got it. After that, we're going to take a break for uh, seven and a half minutes and be seated at 10, and we'll still be on time. We're on time now. Okay. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Jim, Danny, and Zach. They do a they do a great job with uh, uh, down here dealing with what they've got to deal with. You know, this is to be honest with you, just frank with you. Uh, we probably service more vehicles out of here than we do anywhere in the fleet. I mean, they're in charge of more vehicles by themselves than we do in the fleet. In Malvern, we're probably second. We're going to be over. We're going to be tied with them or a little bit over after we add on a can. But right now. They, they do the most, and so you you got to kind of be patient with them. They're working on 30 vehicles plus trailers plus anything else that comes in here. Um, he was talking about cranking it. The, the, how we want to handle this is before, if you get in your truck, of course, you're not going to know until you turn on the key that it's going to crank slow. If it cranks slow, just stop. Call Ben, have it, the Qualcomm backed up, because once we nuke them, we fry them, there's no getting that information back. The information's gone. So we need to get that information. And then, you know, get a hold of Jim. Jim will get you charged up, get you going, and stuff like that. If you're out in the road somewhere, it doesn't matter because they can back it up from anywhere. They communicate everywhere. So we want to make sure, and we certainly don't want to be frying these units at $800 a piece. Okay. Um, an, uh, EFS checks. The reason that I said that to Steve is because you know, for years we've had com checks, and I want you to take all those old com checks, and fleet I want you to checks? the fleet. Well, fleet com one checks. Com checks. Check your phone I know. <laughs> I want you to take all your old checks that don't look like the checks that you have in your hands, and I want you to throw them away. Get them out of your truck, and if you stop by a truck stop, grab you a couple of the EFS checks because they're at every counter at a truck stop, so you have them because there's no more bigger pain in the world than, than you calling me, and or you calling Jim, and asking him to cut you a check, and or, you, know, you broke down, you need to pay for it, and we go, do you have your checks? And you say, oh no, I didn't pick them up. Well then we gotta get a credit card. And some places will take you know, my word for it that I have this credit card in front of me and I'm reading off the numbers, and other places we have to fax stuff back and forth. It's taking more time to do it. It's very inconvenient. We've got the EFS set up for the simple fact of repair, you know, for paying for repairs. So just have the checks. That's that's the easiest thing to said to done with that. Uh, fraudulent in EFS. 
Mr. Philip Talton can tell you, I don't know, it was five, ten years ago. Wow. You know, I get a call from a guy. Uh, well, what happened was he called up to the main place up here because he read the number off of his door. He was sitting at a truck stop. He calls up there, asks, asks whoever answered the phone up there, hey, who's your maintenance director there? They gave him my name. This guy calls me on the phone. He says, hey, how you doing, Jeff? He calls me by name. And I'm like, well, this guy must know me. He says, hey, I got this truck, 1341. It's in a, it's in a, a work zone here in Tennessee. He's blown a steer tire. I need you to cut me a check for this amount of money. And I go, well, first of all, I need to talk to the driver. Oh, you can't talk to the driver. The driver's back with state trooper. You know, state trooper is going to tow him if I don't fix him and get him out of here. I said, go ahead, tow him. I said, I ain't cutting you a check. Well, this guy called me, to make a long story short, he called me at least five more times. He wouldn't give up. He kept on just calling me, calling me, calling me. So I called Philip. And I said, where in the world are you at? He said, I'm sitting at a truck stop. I said, there's a dude somewhere looking at your truck right now, and he's calling me, asking me for money. And the whole point I'm, I'm saying about this is once I, myself or whoever, gives a code to one of these EFS checks, it's gone. It's, it's gone. We can probably get, get it back if we really, really went through all the process, which would be really, really difficult. But once it's gone, it's gone. So myself, Jim, I don't care who's cutting the check. They are not going to cut the check unless they're talking to you. And that's just the way it is. With the new checks, we give money codes if anybody's used them yet. It's not like the old check, okay? When you call in, I need to know who I'm paying it to. In other words, TA, interstate, anything like that. Once he gives, you give him that, the amount, he's going to go into the computer or on his phone, and he's going to get a money code. He's going to give it back to you. You put the money code on the check, okay? You give it to the person, and that's it. Over, done with, kaput, okay? But we have a major, major problem that we're going to eliminate. For some reason, people like to get stuff fixed or get stuff done, and they don't want to get receipts, okay? Well, we need receipts. We have to have receipts because... Simple fact, I had a guy on 70 up in Ohio, got fixed. I told him, I was physically talking to him on the telephone. I told him, I said, get a receipt before you leave. Okay? No problem. I'll do it. This receipt never did come in, never did come in, never did come in. Ben, ben calls me and he says, hey, I got this check. And he said, it's for like $470 and it's from Missouri. And I'm saying... What the heck's going on? So the only way I knew what it was, the, the company that was a, was a repair site, their main base was in Missouri, but I compared the time, the date, and everything else with the amount of money that was charged. And I never had a receipt for it. So we had to call these people and get a receipt. It's not my job. It's not Jim's job. It's not nobody else's job. It's your job to bring back a receipt. If the guy won't get your receipt, you said, hey, dude, before you write this up, let me take a picture of it. Just take a picture of it. At least I'll have something to go on. I have to have something to document where that money went to. Okay? So, got that covered. Uh, DVIRs. Okay? Uh, I, I don't want to beat a horse to death, but you know what? We, we have to. We have a standard operational procedure we follow. ISO. Okay? It requires us, it tells us in detail what we're supposed to do in each procedure. One of them is filling out one of these, okay? There's three copies in this. Can anybody tell me what the three, three different colors copies there are? Well, one of them. The white one goes in the dash and the yellow and the yellow will go back to the, the truck. To the truck and the pink one goes on fire. Okay, that's, that's good, but there's kind of another step in there. Okay, you got three copies, okay? You have to fill these out. It's not a, if I fill them out. You have to fill them out. It says right here at the top of it, we didn't put this on here. It says it's a DOT requirement that we fill these out, okay? And it's got right here at the bottom, it's got instructions on which 
where each copy goes. It's not hard. So when we fill one out, we take the white copy, we put on the dash of our truck until the repair is done. We turn in the yellow and the pink copy, okay? Jim does the work. He takes your yellow copy and puts back in these fancy boxes that we put down here for this reason. This reason right here. And what are you supposed to do before you leave with the truck the next day? Put a sign off on it that the work has been done and well, leave it so he can separate it and get his copy. He'll put yours back in the box. Wrong. Pretty close though. Pretty close. Good. Good. Okay. So you sign here where it says driver's signature when you, re when you turn it in. He's going to sign here and you're going to sign here and date it. And when you come and sign it the last time, the yellow and the pink, you take the yellow with you and it goes in the cab of the truck. You can take the white and throw it away. It's no good anymore. You need to keep that yellow in the truck, okay? He keeps the pink for his records, okay? Because a number of ones that we had in here, we did an audit on him for ISO and, well, he had two, but that's enough. He had two in here that he had done everything he was supposed to do. But the driver had never signed off on it. But I have one of them with mine, I know. And well, you, you got to sign it the next day before. The car ain't fixed. And huh? It's got holes in it, and I wouldn't sign off on it. So that was correct. You shouldn't sign yeah, off. Yeah, you shouldn't sign off. Okay. But bottom line is, mechanic repair signs off. You sign mm -hmm. off. You take your copy in the truck. How long it's got to be in the truck? 24 hours. So you got that copy. That's all law says. 24 hours now to prove. That way, if... He writes up a truck, the mechanic fixes it, and I come in, I sign off, I leave the shop the copy that's been fixed, and I got proof that that truck was fixed. Why? Because if DOT pulled me over for a tail light yesterday, and they pull me over today, which they know every truck that's going down the road in the whole United States that got pulled over, I got a piece of paper that says it's fixed. Okay. Well, right? what, what about our drop trailer situation? We're always swapping trailers. I sign something up to get fixed, and then... He's going to put it in your trailer. box. Right, and, and I'll still sign off on it, so what if another driver takes it and it gets... And that, that is kind of a fine line in between. You wrote it up, you wrote it up, you put it in your truck. I'll put it that way. Okay. You wrote it up, you signed off on it, you put it in your truck. Because I know you have separate trailers. We don't have all time units down here, permanently assigned units. Just do that with it. Okay. Communicate. Yeah. Say, hey, we need to determine who's taking this trailer. I'm not taking it tomorrow. Make sure they get the DVIR. Yeah. Um, what's the three what what's some of the times that we fill out things there's there's specific times that we have to fill these out exactly that's your failure okay and number three non-routine maintenance if it's a headlight something that's not routine if it's not an oil change or a grease job or putting tires or brakes on non-routine maintenance Accidents, sensor failures, non-routine maintenance from the day the defect occurs and each day after until it's fixed. That's what the law says. Or if you get DOT and shut down the side of the road or you have a breakdown on the road, you need to you need to fill one out while you're waiting for the repair guy. When he gets there, he'll sign right off on no problem. Had haven't had any problems at all with people doing that. You gotta do it. Okay? And then in that case you bring the yellow and the pink both back with us so we can put them in our records, okay? Uh, the only other thing I've got is, I, you know, everywhere I know that drivers like to stay in their trucks and stuff, but I, I got a scenario for you real, real quick, and I want you to answer it. So your personal car, the air conditioner goes out in it. What do you do? It okay. When, when you take it to the shop, can they always fix it that day? Okay. So what do you do? You deal with it and drive another car or whatever you have to do, okay? I know it's inconvenient. It's not like that we sit here and think, well, how can I get this guy by taking him out of his truck? But there are certain things that you're going to have to do, especially with these new trucks. These new trucks have five-year, 500,000-mile warranties on them. We're going to use the five-year, 500,000-mile warranty. We're going to take it up the Freightliner, Cummins, wherever we have to take it, and get it fixed. Okay, because we paid for that. And if there's a repair to be done, just be patient. They will get it done just as quick as they can. But don't give my guys a hard time about getting out of your trucks. You know, just 
do what you need to do. They'll get it fixed as quick as they can, and then we'll move on. Okay. Okay? All right. We good? Everything. Okay, we're going to take a break for five minutes, get back at it. I got about 10, 15 minutes of stuff. Roger's got 10 minutes. Driver of the quarter words. We're pulling the plug. <laughs> five minutes sharp. Ready, set, go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 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 Yeah, Yeah, don't cut it off now. Wait till we go back then. I had a question for you. Yeah, let's say we're on the road. And let's just say, for instance, we see a marker like that. Yeah. 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 If we ride it out on the DVR, have you ever, like, and I guess, I, I mean, I know that covers our butt. But, but I always wonder, I thought, I wonder if they try to give you a ticket for it and then if you say, well, no, no, I've done a free trip and I wrote it up. Yeah. But I wonder if I keep you out of getting a ticket. Yeah, yeah, I would say if you're out on the road and you have a cab light out, go get it. That's what I told my guys. Yeah, okay. I write it up yeah. until you get to a place to get it fixed, okay. but get it fixed. Okay. We'll pay the money. Because I'm telling you, they nicked us to freaking death a couple years ago about shit. And and we just we are so good, which Steve never even showed it. We are so freaking good that we fucking put ourselves in a hell of a bind. Because we have put nothing in It's like almost a fun something. Yeah, well, no, no. it's We have nothing to talk about. We're so low that they're not going to check us, but when they do get a sudden, it's a sense of luck. Because how it works is stuff falls off to make you go or clean you have it. And so it's made, it's happening. I've always wondered, I've 
Well, we say the same thing. You'll be told sometimes if you get in the When I work in the media one day, I got all this old guy who claimed the guy was on the media. He was in the media for a year. Like that, we had truck on the phone. Yeah, you'd be talking in the bed after you come in. We wanted to have my car with the car. I gave you a ride. I appreciate people. Thank you very much for doing that. I Well, I appreciate that. Well, I appreciate that. You know, that's that's my line. You've got some. 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 you Coming in. Oh, I appreciate that, Carnell. I appreciate everything you did. Right. She's here. You got She's in my son's house. Yeah, I know. Sit right. down. Right. Now, wait a minute. No, you have not No, I know, I know. Right. 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 What's that mean on our end? Because I try to lose. If we log out. That's so it's easier for me and Anna to assign it. We just automatically go, okay, here's Randall and Sheet. Truck 1902 moved, the sign of the shop. But on our you end, you're on the route. They move the truck from off the hill up here and load it and throw it out on the front line, and then it logs it on duty. It automatically goes back to the driver. So you're going to have to But they're doing it. Right. You know what I'm saying? On the old phone. But next time we're down, we'll look out. You've got to log out on the truck. They did that before when you turn them on the new trucks. Right. 89 and 90. Yeah. They put me on duty. Yeah. And it shows me being on duty all night. Even though I was clogged out. I was clogged out. But I was the last truck driver that was clogged out. I was the last driver that was clogged out. I was clogged out. But I was the last driver that was clogged out. I was clogged out. So when they put it on the other side, it logged me back in when they put it in the building. And it, it showed me on duty all night long. There was a front pass. That's what I was like. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. We're rolling. Okay. I got things to do. All right. Let's go. Yeah, I meant to tell y'all that. Roger, I'm going to do the, the 10 ELV thing, stick you up and do the slide. Okay, here we go. Jeffersonville, they're moving everything across the street. I'm going to let Roger talk about that, but there is a lot of crazy looking freight that I'm glad I'm not hauling out of there. Some really skinny slid coils standing up in racks and some wacky pallets. And what I want to make sure that you guys understand is when you get those really thin stand-ups, okay, don't be looking at the eye when you're trying to secure it. Best way to do it is belly wrap the top of the coil. You can use a two-inch ratchet strap to do it. Just snug it up, that way if it separates, it doesn't crush you. Because if you get a, even a thin coil falls on you, you are Damn. dead. Okay? So you put that belly wrap to the top, stick it out to the sides, couple clicks on it, throw all your chains on it, that way you can safely work on the eye side. Alright? Um, we've had some incidents where they're tipping in the racks and stuff like that till they get it figured out because we're going to acquire a whole bunch of new traffic out of there. So there is some different looking loads. Um, and we had a picture of one. This was just some thin stuff. Uh, this should have had an X on the rear. Yep. Make sure freight does come off the back of the trailer. We proved it down here. Front and rear, make sure you got at least three pieces of securement on it, okay? 
So if you get new freight and it's something really screwy, take a picture for me because I'm trying to communicate and spread the love so that nobody gets hurt if there's new things that we're doing, all right? And I've got a bunch more that the next meeting we have, uh, we'll show those pictures if you guys happen to go over there. CSA update, since um, October 2018, I just tried to go back to a period where we could show improvement. Our unsafe driving is down to 8%, it's down a total of 7%. Excellent job by you guys making it to the end of the year, making sure we didn't go over the threshold and bump into peer group three. Congratulations, everybody back it down a notch. We are off to a terrible start to the year. I sent a fleet message out the other day. Two left lane violations, two speed warnings. Speed warnings written on a DOT inspection are the same as a ticket for your CSA score, okay? They count just like a ticket. So the cop ain't doing you a favor by putting a warning on there. A ticket you can dispute, a warning you cannot, all right? So I'm not gonna have a long summer, but you might. When can you drive a commercial motor vehicle in the left lane when there's two or more lanes in one direction? When can you, when? Never. Never, that's federal law. There is a few places down here I know where they allow you to do it. Here's my recommendation. Don't, don't drive a truck in the left lane if there's more than two lanes in one direction. All right, it is federal law, you got a CDL, you're supposed to know, I've said it a thousand times, um, and I can prove by a couple people sitting in this room that if you drive a truck in the left lane, they will pull you over and write your ticket, okay? So just don't do it. Maintenance down to 17%, uh, down 5%, crash remains at 1%, it's down 2% overall, that's awesome, I'm still cheering for a zero, I would like to see that before I'm dead. Hours of service, awesome, zero. In-house, we're averaging 25 hours of service violations per month. Most of those, we're getting trapped inside somewhere. Um, drivers are doing a better job of communicating to dispatch, hey, I only have an hour and a half, I'm never gonna be able to get loaded at Huger. You know, if we know it takes three hours to load inside a place and you're gonna arrive there with 15 minutes, what should you do? Not go, right? We don't, we don't wanna do dumb stuff because we'd have to prove that. I'd have to fight about it possibly at some point, so. <laughs> it's only funny till Roger's writing the check, right? Think before you stop, stop and look where you're walking, wear your PPE, summer's coming up. You saw the picture of me with full airborne pathogen PPE on. Did it for years and years and years, all right? No mercy. If I see you wearing shorts, pants, or a short shirt, and I'm going to give you advance warning, we're going to be here without notice multiple times over the summer. It won't be me. It'll be other people I send in to do it. You're going home for the day, and I don't care who's angry about it. If you can't protect yourself, I will, all right? Or you can ask one of the people that's got themselves cut to ribbons, all right? Don't wear shorts or short sleeve shirts when you're loading a truck. If you want to drive in shorts, I don't have a problem with that, all right? Change your clothes after, all right? Be aware of potential falls, the split, the split coils falling on you, things fall, falling on you, cranes running into you, or stepping off the side of the trailer. Leave yourself out with the Smith system. That's your body too. If a crane's coming at you, we have a lot of crane hits here, guys. Big ones, 40,000 pound load on the crane, wham, knocks our whole curtain side kit off all the time. When a crane is coming to put something on the deck, where should you be? Not on the deck. Not on the deck if at all possible, not on the deck, okay? Please, slow down a little bit, take the time to not get hurt. <coughs> what type of units are we operating in our trucks right now? What is this thing right here? It's an AOBR until I say so, okay? The firmware just gives this thing the ability to operate as an ELD, and when I check the box, <coughs> it's gonna be an ELD. That's coming here in the next six to eight weeks. It'll be small groups by the terminal, and that'll be it. EOBR, it's important, depending on what state you're in and what cop you're talking to, an EOBR is the same thing as an AOBR. Electronic onboard recording device, automatic onboard recording device. But if you say you got an ELD and you got an AOBR, the cop's going to write you a $350 ticket. All right? New insurance cards, make sure you got an insurance card, take time to check your permits. When you walk around your truck, 
had a guy get stopped the other day that didn't know where his ABI sticker is. The cop was going to write it up for him. Where are they? In the front of the trailer and on the frame rail by the step on every unit we have. That's the new standard operating procedure. So when you do your pre-trip, look at the ABI sticker, the annual vehicle inspection. You can never drive a vehicle if it's expired. Your IFTA expires and any special permits, if there's heavy haul stuff going on, make, make sure and check your permits. Uh, permitted loads, the fines are gigantic. Make sure your permits are correct. Does anybody here have a question on the bonus plans? We had a lot of uh, terminals ask about the bonus plans, wanted it presented. I think everybody here understands it. Does everybody understand the safety bonus, the performance bonus, and then the um, fuel. fuel bonus? Struggling here. Is so, no, so I'll breeze over, I'll give you the short version and I have some handouts if anybody has questions after this. So by a show of hands, who doesn't understand the bonus program? Couple? All right. If you new guys, Steve, if you want one, I got papers on it. It's in your driver's manual. But the safety bonus is 2% of your gross revenue. All right. Accidents, citations, DOT roadside violations all go into that and there's a written policy in your book and I have that single page that tells you how, what percentage you lose. Uh, if you've had a minor or a major accident or a citation, you could lose half of it or anything. A minor accident is $1,000, a major is $2,000 and one cent. If it's in between, safety committee decides whether it's a minor or a major. Your quarterly bonus is 2% of your gross revenue also. There's a 1% bonus goal. If your truck does say $30,000, you're gonna get 1%. If it does 40,000, you're gonna get 2%. Okay, that's how that works. A lot, of, I think the confusion is the quarterly bonus is tied to the performance bonus. I'm sorry, the quarterly bonus is tied to the safety bonus. So if you have a major, if you have a $3,500 accident, you could lose both your safety and your quarterly bonus. I wanna make sure everybody understands that, yeah. Your safety is actually based on your gross income, is it, not your revenue? Because it's less than what your quarterly, yeah, your, your safety yes. bonus is based on your You are income. correct. Then the fuel bonus here is based on what 50% of the drivers did over the last three quarters. There's three categories, over speed, over RPM, and idle, okay? Um, if there's anybody that has a CPAP machine, you don't get a fuel bonus. You're already spending 100 bucks a day on fuel. I'm sorry, that's the way it is. We've really tried to accommodate the CPAP thing by putting inverters in the trucks for those guys. You're out of the loop on the fuel bonus. Um, everywhere I work, you couldn't get the fuel bonus. They just set it up so you couldn't. Here, uh, I, I see the numbers go out. Almost everybody gets it, okay? Our idle time is creeping up, and uh, Brad has asked me to talk about that. Please, shut them off. Fuel is one of our biggest expenses. $3.3 million is what I forecast this year for fuel. Last year it was 2.7, 2.7 million. Giant expense, okay? Yeah, Tim? I got a question. When you drive, say, eight hours straight, and you pull in somewhere, shouldn't you let your truck run for about 10 minutes, let it cool down a little bit, or do you just shut it straight off? Let it run, let it run for a little bit time? and shut it off. Do yep. we get that time added? Yeah, to you're not, it's not near as tight as what you, would think yes you need to let it spool down okay. it'll that's spool down a little bit it's whatever the fleet's doing as long as you meet that yeah. then you're going to get it that's not going to kill you it's not complicated that. what's going to kill you is not, i usually let it run for a few minutes yeah. what's going to kill you is letting it run all the every stop that you go to and everything like that and just letting it run all the time well well that and the s-bar heaters need to go or to be outsourced to be repaired right uh yeah if you got an s-bar heater it's not working that's we are notified of that, and that's kind of works in there, yeah. Okay. If anybody's got bonus questions, I can answer them after the meeting. It is in your driver's manual, um, and we just follow that protocol exactly with safety committee. That's how that works. Brad couldn't be with us because he's got a sick relative, probably two meetings he's missed in 35 years. Uh, so he's got to do what he's got to do. Um, for the Smith system, again, we're talking about cell phones. Don't play God. Um, put the phone down. What do I mean by playing God? If you're messing with your phone and you slam into somebody's car and kill them, you're playing God, right? You're taking their right to live away. Please don't do that. 
We had an incident here where the driver swerved to avoid a truck that was going slow with no four-way flashers on, tore his mirror off, messed up his door, 2600 bucks. you know, a mirror's a grand, then the door and the hinges and all that. Can I, can I prove that the guy was messing with his phone? No, I can't. I, I drove three million miles. I've messed with my phone when I'm driving. I've hit the zipper a couple of times. Don't do it, guys. Should you talk on a headset when you're driving? Probably not, okay? If you get in a collision, what's the first thing they're going to do? See your phone. Right. They're going, to pull your <laughs> they're going to pull your phone records from the phone company. So our policy just says no messing with electronic handheld devices. The policy is three-day suspension, then termination. Since I've worked here, there's only been, I believe, two people terminated because of it. Remember, on the cameras, I am not the only person that sees that. The insurance company sees it. Whatever I have for a policy, I have to follow. If you get snagged on your phone, you're going to get a vacation and then terminate it, okay? There are exceptions to every rule. Accidents, you know, emergencies. I'm not going to bust you for common sense things, but please, don't be messing with your phone when you're driving. I'm terrible about it. I put my phone in the back of my car now because I get calls constantly from the time I leave work till. 11 o'clock every night. But my car answers the phone by itself. If it doesn't, that's when I don't answer the phone. Then I have to pull over and get my phone out of the truck and call you back if it didn't connect to my car. So put the phone away. Um, it can wait. We're reinforcing with the office staff. They should not be calling or texting you. Um, they are supposed to look and confirm the vehicle is stopped. And I was really proud of a couple of guys. There's a couple of guys here, a couple of guys in Northbrook where I looked, guy was stopped, I texted him really quick, hey, can you call me? And he, the message came back, I'm driving, I'll call you later. Awesome. That's a good re auto reply to have on your phone. Okay? And what it was is that lag in the Omnitrack system, he had just taken off from, I think it was Spring Lake, Michigan, and, and I couldn't see that he was driving. I did do my due diligence and look to make sure he's not driving, okay? The correct way to handle this is send a message to the truck that says, Phil, please call me today. Please call me right now. Please call me immediately. Um, be specific. Say who you are in the message. This is what I'm teaching office people to do. And give the correct phone number and extension to call you back. Phil, call me this week when you have time. Not urgent. Thanks, Steve. Blah, blah, blah. Extension 203. Be short, decisive, right to the point. Give them a number to call back at. Do not text or call drivers, man. If they ever crash, we're going to hang as, as a group. Um, in the same part, don't call me when you're driving. There's, there's nothing that urgent, okay? Wait till you stop. And again, do not stop on the side of the roadway to make a phone call. The next time you stop is fine. So a lot of people are like, well, my, sometimes my wife calls me. What if there's an emergency? If there's an emergency, give your wife my phone number. Why? Because I don't want you to freak out when you're driving. If your kid got hurt, your wife got hurt, whatever. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you a message. If you ever see a message from me that the very first word is emergency, it's an emergency. That's a no-no word with me. I will never use the word emergency unless it's an emergency. And I'm going to get you stopped, and then I'm going to tell you your kid got hurt, okay? I'm not going to tell you that when you're driving an 80,000-pound missile. If your wife calls you, she's going to be going off the rail, right? Oh, Bad hell. situation. <laughs> so you can give anybody my phone number you want to so that we, we don't upset you when you're driving. So. Please, we've had a uh, no, I've had I've just been sanded down by the insurance company. Okay, drop the phones. All right, there's a number of people here that, you know, messing with an iPad, whatever. When you're driving, you should only be driving. Automatic replies. Put it where you can't reach it. Tell your family that you won't be answering the phone while you're driving, so that you can get home safely. If you crash, you're not getting home. Tell, give them my cell phone number. Tell them to call me. Um, before we do Roger's business update, I'm going to go over the ELD thing real quick. You guys are, are the first ones to get that. So the ELD update started on uh, 312. All right. And <coughs> it has been difficult. Trouble. 
So what happened is they pushed firmware update over the, over the air. What, what is firmware? It's the software that's on that board in the unit that makes the unit capable of being an ELD. All right, we all are operating AOBRs until I say so. You are still in AOBR mode. If you take one thing away from this, all right, this is a very important thing. The enforcement software, when your logs go in a DOT inspection, automatically detect hours of service violations and they detect movement when you are in non-driving mode. They had a webinar last week that Brad and I watched and they are telling us in advance, we are going to write false log citations for this and shut you down, okay? So if you creeped out of the building in Hugo, <coughs> it's gonna show up on your eight day tab. It always has, okay? But now law enforcement has the ability when your logs go to their laptop in their car, that it's gonna tell them two minute drive segment no driving in the bunk or on the brake. No more creeping. Creeping party's over. Oh, All right? Man. What's that? I said, oh man. Call All right. Me. You're in a <laughs> winder. <coughs> so here's an important thing to know when your screen freezes. I need your truck number and your uh, name, and I will send you a mobile reset. It has been tough, guys. I've had about 390 phone calls in the past two weeks. It stops at 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night and starts up at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. Exhausted. Not anything you or me can do. If it freezes, we got to unfreeze it to make it go. Some guys I've had to mobile reset four or five times, ten times, all right? A couple times during the day and then when they shut down at night. So we've determined a couple of things that cause you to freeze up. You've never logged off. Make sure to log off. What that happen, allows to happen is there's fix patches that get pushed over the air. When you shut your key off, the power's on for three hours, those patches will come across and fix some of these bugs that we're working out. Make sure you don't have 3,000 messages. Delete your messages. You shouldn't be running more than 50 messages at any time. If you have a lot, call me and I will smoke them. Go ahead and smoke mine. Um, <laughs> of course you're a slacker. <laughs> um, so a driver, I've had three drivers, three young guys working on this for the past two weeks for me to try to determine when the cursor flashes on the screen and it freezes up, what it is, okay? We've had a number, we've had three cases closed with Omnitrax, things they've fixed that were known problems. I just found this out at three o'clock yesterday. If you're on the home screen, all right, if, you are, if you've pushed the little house button, up here in the corner, you push the home screen. Do not push the back button. Do not push that arrow. It's a bug and it causes it to lock up and there's no way to fix it, okay? Except for me to send a mobile reset. So until I get a patch out, I called in a case number on this yesterday. Hopefully it'll get fixed soon. When you're on the home screen, do not push the back button on an MCP50. There's another thing I wanna show you guys on the home screen. See this little arrow button? You push this arrow button, over here it says system. Push system, and it's going to show you, there's sometimes there's a version button, button that pops up, you push version. Up here, firmware, 1379R. That's what your truck should be running. A couple weeks I'm going to send a message out that says, anybody that doesn't have version 1379R, please call me and leave a message. I'm going to have to come take a thumb drive and install it on your truck or Jim's gonna have to. The next thing right underneath that, it says Win, which is Windows Operating System, LTO40. A lot of the trucks here are running version 33. So I'm gonna send a message out that says you should be running either 33 or 40. If you're running anything else, call me. Gonna have to put a thumb drive and fix it. It's gonna be small. Um, for the maintenance guys, any unit that I've flashed, if it has a sticker on the back like this one does, I always put a note on them the date I flashed it, it's good to go because I've already put version 40 on it. So again, on the home screen, you press the arrow, hit system, and then you hit version, which I've already hit so it keeps showing up, and you're uh, 1379R or 40. Important to know. The good news is, is once that firmware is updated, when I actually click the box for ELD, you're not going to notice much change. So lastly, on the ELD thing, is with an AOBR, it used to be 7 tenths of a mile, 5 miles an hour, or 5 minutes. 
Okay, the reason I left that five minutes there is because I'm a driver and it's to your advantage. It wasn't picking up those little ticks of drive times. So I probably shouldn't say that. I that's know. why I left it like that, right? Okay, so now that's going to work backwards to your advantage because that drive button is grayed out, right? So it automatically detects you driving, but still in the system, the smallest time increment to be logged is five minutes. So once I switch everybody over to ELDs, I'm gonna change that to one minute. Why? Because if you take a 32 minute break and take off, you can't control your driving anymore, right? The right. worst it could rip you off is one minute if I change that to it. But Minutes were removed from the equation by our federal government, and they said that any trucks that's wheels turn seven tenths of a mile for five miles an hour will be in drive mode. Okay? So, when you let out the clutch, you've probably never noticed it, but every big truck goes over five miles an hour. That little surge initially. Yeah. So, basically, when you move the truck, it's going to be in drive mode. I had three drivers call me and go, like, You got to back this up, you got to change it the other way. We we can't do this. I can't change it. I didn't write the software. The government did. Okay? That's the way the ELDs operate. Deadlines December 16, 2019. In eight weeks, over the next few weeks, I'm going to start transitioning to ELDs and we'll be done. Make sure you log out at least once a week. Make sure you delete your messages. Does anybody have questions on? Uh... Yes, sir. If we're logged out, you're telling us that when they bow and the rest of these guys pull our trucks in the building, and it's not going to put us on drive line it like should, it used to. Yeah, that was a, a bug on the IVG units, the new units, and that has supposedly been fixed. Yes. So it shouldn't be doing that. So if you're a driver that comes into this yard, and the, the traffic coordinators are going to drive your truck, Bo is going to drive it, log out. Make sure you're logged out. Because he's going to write on that sheet that he operated the truck, and we're going to assign the miles to him. Okay? Steve? So say like, you pick up a facility and uh, you had the hours to get loaded and leave to get to a truck stop, but they ran you out of hours and you sit and wait to get loaded, but they have overnight parking. So say if you're in the bay and the overnight parking areas are around the side of the building, so even if you just pull around and do that, since you still can't legally leave because you're out of hours, right. that would still count against you? Yeah, I mean, I'm not holding it against you. The biggest thing uh, is to remark it correctly. Delayed at shipper. That's what I do the first thing. Every day I print out the hours of service violations. I go look at your log. As long as you remarked it correctly, say it was six minutes or something, I just print it out, staple to the violation. You did everything you could do. You did nothing wrong. If it's going to be more than 15 minutes, you should call me, and I'll log it on my phone log that you called, and I still do the same thing. Uh, most, most of our violations are less than 15 minutes. Almost everybody remarks them correctly, and I just staple it to the violation. It is what it is. Yeah. Yesterday I took a 30 minute break at Whitfield and I noticed when I left, like I said, you can't put it back on drive. I had drove close to a mile and I was running 65 miles an hour and it still was on uh, off duty for a while that way. Then it finally flipped over. It looked like it was maybe. That's because of the five minute time increment. And I, I, I don't, I'm very scared to flip the switch on that. And the reason is one, it's going to send a fleet message out to all you that a parameter has been changed. Now you know that. If you get some wacky, I'm going to send a message out in advance. I did it the other day when I updated our address. I send a message out in advance that says, I'm going to update our carrier profile. You guys don't have to do anything. When I flip the switch on that time increment, I'm going to send one out in advance that says, you don't have to do anything. I'm switching the time increment to one minute. That's going to work to your advantage. So then you could take a 31 minute and 30 second break, drive away, the worst it could back up is one minute. Right now it's still on the five minute parameter because we're in AOBR mode. Once I click the ELD box, there is really no time parameter that relates to driving. There's only a minimum duty status, which I'll make one minute. Does that mean it's got a, did it, did you need to take a 35 minute break now? Right now you should still be doing the 35 minute break. Okay, a couple guys have shorted themselves. Last point, I cannot, when the ELD box is checked, I cannot change drive time and either can you. So I'm going to get out a new instruction sheet. In the cab, you're going to have to have the ability to know what to do for a sensor failure. Do you guys know what to do for a sensor failure? You call Steve. Steve tells you what to do. Steve sets it up with the shop and decides if we need to get a repair done. Steve will tell you to continue on e-logs or e-rods, electronic record of duty status, if 
It's just a one instance. You've been in a building for three hours and it lost signal, I'm gonna call it a one-time instance. I'm the only one, or Ann is the only one, or Brad, we can look at the back end software and see what is failing. There's only a few parts, so we can identify what's wrong. So every time there's a sensor failure, whether it's in cab or I see it, you gotta call me, okay? So that I can put it on the log that's required by the government, then we'll, we will instruct you what to do. So if law enforcement asks you right now what to do, we call safety and they will set up the repair with the shop. But I'm gonna give you an instruction sheet for the cab shortly once they get done messing around with updating what the rules are. Uh, what to do for sensor failures, that you're in ELD mode, um, and a reminder to have in-cab instruction sheets and a blank logbook. Everybody knows your previous eight days hours are on the eight day tab. If you have a sensor failure, I'm either gonna fax or send you a picture of your previous seven days logs. A lot of you guys have done that. And it's, easy, it's a quick way for you to know what kind of logs you got. There's one more thing I need to show you guys on here. Uh, the Federal Motor Carrier's Omnitrax webinar the other day. So you've got that laminated in cab instruction sheet. The ELD law says that you have to have a manual in the truck besides that enforcement sheet. All Omnitrax units, even the IVGs, have a full drive, <laughs> driver's manual and enforcement manual on the unit. All you gotta do is press the help screen, the question mark, you're gonna see all the manual right there. So I looked through all this yesterday. The most useful parts says hours of service part one. Anything a cop wants to see is gonna be on there, okay? Tells you what to do for diagnostics and mail functions, which are sensor failures, how to edit your logs. Um, does everybody know how to edit their logs? Guessing that's going to be a no. <laughs> it's on the certified tab, which used to be the approved tab. If you still haven't got the upgrade, you can edit it. You can split the time in half. Um, how many people in here don't know how to edit their log? Show of hands. I don't mess with them. Stay over for a minute and I'll show you how to do it, okay? Um, you, you're going to have to be able to prove to a cop that you know what to do for sensor failures, that you know how to edit your law log um, that you've got all the in-cab requirements, the card, the manual, the log book. It's complicated. Any questions? Yeah, with this thing, this thing, um, can we, if we have to, if we have a sense of failure and it puts us on duty and we have to edit, edit it to the drive line, are we able to edit to drive? Yes, you can't just, you cannot remove any drive time. Okay. So, and before there was, like if you got shorter break, a uh, break, one minute or something, I was able to override it and fix it. I will not be able to do that anymore. Okay, so get used to that now. So if you short your break one minute, what do I got to tell you to do in the future? Take another, break. Take another break. If you come out of the bunk 15 minutes early, think that never happens, it happened yesterday. Guy come out 15 minutes early, what am I going to have to do? Welcome to wherever you're at, man. You're going to have to take another 10. So here's what I advise you to do. Hold your finger before you push the button. Think before you push the button. Make sure you got 10 hours because it'll short you. I check you. every time. All right? Because I ain't doing another thing. Okay, Roger, you got it. And then we're going to do the driver quarter awards. Any more questions on the ELDs? I, I know the fleet message has been crazy. I'm trying to keep you posted. I am fatigued. I mean, it has been two weeks of 24 hours a day phone calls. I appreciate everybody's patience. Um, I do believe we were the guinea pigs for the MCP50s. We were the first ones to get it pushed to because two days later, all of a sudden on Omnitrack's website, it said, beginning in March, we're going to push this firmware. That wasn't up when they were sending it to us, right? You got it, Roger. I was, I was about ready to get the hook. <laughs> they gotta know, man. It's information they gotta know. I understand. I understand that. Uh, there's a whole lot to understand, though. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm sitting here trying to absorb it. I'm old ADD, and it's tough. Okay. So uh, I don't expect everybody to be perfect. And there's a whole lot yet we gotta go through, and and uh, I get get used to, and. Keep trying and doing the best you can. That's all I can ask. You know, just keep trying and doing the best you can. So uh, there is a whole lot of stuff. And I think Steve was really the guy who pushed this as hard as anybody. And 
and I, I sincerely think we may we may be the first or second truck line that they, you know, push the dome this way. So unfortunately, that is what it is. So, um, I want to welcome everybody every this morning, and uh, uh, the, 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 got a couple new people. Uh, Steve, I know is new, and uh, Blair, where you at, Blair? Uh, and uh, and Devin, traffic coordinator, Devin, there he is back here. So welcome, you guys. Um, uh, I got a, one thing first is uh, you are the still the oldest driver. Paperwork. You don't. Remember what Steve told you today, but if you don't remember anything else, please remember this. When you leave here, you make sure you have your proper paperwork with you. You have to have the bill of lading, and you have to have the delivery receipt. All right? It doesn't do us any good when it's in here in the, in the panel, in your box. And I think I won't show hands of those who, you know, me without paperwork, but it, it don't work that way. And the second thing that's equally important is when you do deliver the load, you have to take a bill waiting, and it has to be signed by the receiver. If you get two copies of the bill waiting, or you got ten copies of the bill waiting, that all has to be turned in. All two copies, all ten copies have to be turned in, signed by the receiver with your signature as well, because. We, in our billing process, have to turn in all these copies of the bill of lading. If there's one's not there, then that delays the billing. And it delays you getting paid. And the whole thing is, you know, a train wreck. So make sure that you turn the bill of lading. Then you got that back here in the back row? Everybody hear me okay? Okay. Same thing with the delivery receipt. Make sure you have the delivery receipt. It's a fake delivery receipt. It's been that way for 40 years that I know of. Has to be signed by the receiver. Okay. Uh, this chain of custody deal. And, you know, ultimately, we're responsible as a carrier to make sure it's done right. And all we're really trying to do is make sure that it's being done right. I know some of these clinics fumble, uh, and all we're trying to do, because we ultimately are responsible, is make sure that they're doing it right. So, make sure you do take the proper chain of custody. Uh, letter uh, with you. Uh, as far as business goes, uh, you know, last year we had a really good year. I mean, uh, I mean, we had a really, really good year overall. I mean, the first quarter this year, I mean, January, February, March, it's not been as good by far this year as it was last year, but we're keeping everybody pretty busy. I mean, there's some days up there where we have a dozen loads, and all of a sudden that dozen loads turns into 20 loads three or four hours later. And sometimes not by design. I don't know what it is. Yeah. I give up trying to figure it out. But I that's mean, just kind of how it is. We just roll with it now. So she says she rolls with it, so we all got to roll with it. That's right. Um, uh, I mean, we're adding six trucks up in Canton. This is as far as equipment goes. We're gonna, we have a lot of business up there. Some of you guys have participated in that. All, we have a lot of guardrail business going to uh, North Carolina and, and Tennessee, and we're going to try to participate more than, more in that than we have. So we're adding some trucks up there here this summer to, uh, to do so. New trucks. Uh, you know, the, 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 this Penco account is, that we haul, you know, we have a, one or two loads a, a day sometimes now. I think by the end of April into May, we're going to see three or four loads a day of that business. So that's going to turn into a pretty good thing for us. So uh, just going to give you a heads up on that. You know, the business with Cross Plus is, is uh, you know, up and down. Some days we don't have anything. Some days we have a bunch of loads here recently. So I think it's starting to kick up a little bit. I think overall business is starting to uh, kick up uh, somewhat. Uh, the Jeffersonville uh, uh, plant down there, some of you guys have been to, 
Uh, they had two locations there. Where we're located, and there's that Eagle Seal, which is up the street. Well, there, the place where we're, we're at, they're uh, moving everything from there up to the Eagle Seal location. So we'll actually be up there. Our shop and everything, will, will, and our fuel and all that, will main, maintain where it's at. Obviously, we're not doing that. But as far as our activity and our business, it's all going to be coming out of the other location. And it's going to be a, a pretty big endeavor. It's, it's, uh, it's 300,000 plus square feet. Some of you may have been there. You haven't. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us uh, because uh, we're getting all the shipping out of there. And I would say that operation is going to become what this is. I mean, in a matter of a year or two. I could see us having 20, 25 trucks down there by next year. Wow. So uh, we're going to grow and expand there. And it's just, I'm grateful we're going to get the opportunity to do so. Uh, we have three trailers I know here that we're going to put rolling carp systems on. I don't know the unit numbers off the top of my head, but I know that those, those ones would have the stair steps out the back. Uh, there's, I think there's three of them that we've identified. We're going to get, and that will be coming up here in the next month or two. So. We'll have to get a plan together to get those out of the fold and get these installed, these rolling current systems. And then we're going to add some trucks here later in the year, uh, probably towards the third or fourth quarter, I'd say the fourth quarter, but we'll have a couple more trucks down here. Uh, Ricky's got a new truck and uh, he's got automatic transmission in it. We've got five of them, we just received five of them. He got one and the four going to Northbrook. Just taking them out there next week, uh, so we're uh, we're hoping that they work out well, and and uh, we're hoping that it's going to enhance our fuel mileage. And, and I drove it with Jeff. I let him drive, but I sat up there, and and uh, they're they're beautiful. I mean, you, know, you got to work another ten years now if you get one. Of them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because there's not much less work you got to do. Yeah, so that's look, another ten years you got to go. Uh, I mentioned up here at the last meeting, you know, we have a kind of change in the, in the uh, command. Uh, you know, Rich retired and Scott Stafford became the GM. And Derek has become the plant manager and part of the world that Jen works in. And, and Kevin and Jer, and, you know, I think it's going pretty well. Uh, so uh, it's all good for us uh, uh, from that perspective. Uh, I talked to Jeremy a little bit about this yesterday and really didn't get a chance to talk to Lee, but uh, we, we all love Jeremy. I love Jeremy. He's like one of my kids. I give him hell when he needs it, and sometimes I give it to him when he don't need it. <laughs> but, you know, you guys are used to calling him. He's like everybody's safe, safe, I don't know, safe go. And, you know, he is valuable to us in a lot of areas other than dispatching loads. Not that he's not good at it. I'm grateful that he can do what he does. He sits in when she's on vacation. And he can multitask with the best of them. But we got to wean himself away from dispatching the loads over the phone. Everybody likes to call him because that's how it's been done. Really, I mean, it's worked. I mean, I'm not saying it hasn't worked, but we got a new person over here. And her responsibility is to dispatch the loads, and he's going to continue to be in the loop, okay, and be involved. But you got to, you know, let's sever our our love a little bit with Jeremy. Because I know y'all love him. He looks out for you, and I know why y'all love him. Same reason I love him. He like everybody likes Jeremy. So, but you know, we also got to utilize him in other areas. As we grow, which is what we're doing, and that's what I'm talking about, you know, he's, it's going to be part of his responsibility to, you know, get loads, back hauls, and other loads lined up for us and diversify. You know, we do a lot more, we do more business with others when you add it all up than we do with Metal USA. I don't know if you guys know that or not, but that's a fact. They are by far our biggest customer as far as the number of loads that we haul for an individual customer down here, but if you take all of our other business and put it together, it's by far exceeds what we do with Metal USA. And we want to continue to expand and grow to a degree. 
and uh, you know that's part of his responsibility. Okay. Uh, our insurance renewal is three one. Everybody got a card. Some of you guys got got them. If you didn't have them, uh, went for a while. Uh, we had a five thousand dollar increase across the board, which is not very much. Our premium was about. I'm going to tell you how much. Does anybody want to take a guess what we oh, spend in insurance? Anybody? A little short of nine hundred thousand. A little short of nine hundred thousand dollars. So a five thousand dollar increase really wasn't a whole lot. I was pretty thankful and grateful that's all it was. And the reason why it was only that much was because how we performed. I mean, I'm being sincere. We're pretty good. And for you new guys, we we set the bar. So it's important that everybody you know does what we talk about doing, and we all police ourselves and do things right. And ultimately, we save, and we outperform the pricing. And as, long, as we continue to do that, and hopefully we're going to be able to continue to do that, what do we do? We get money back. And what do we do with the money we get back? Everybody gets a little piece of it. How many guys have gotten a little piece of it? Everybody here. So uh, it's working. And, and I'm just I'm going to again thank you all because we, we did have a pretty good renewal. Uh, I have a friend that, that owns a truck line in our group, and uh, he got his renewal about a week before we got ours. And uh, he called me, man. He was freaking hot. He was screaming, yeah, I thought he was going to come through the phone. Uh, we, buy an ex we buy an extra excess of liability insurance, which means we basically buy an additional million dollars of the coverage. And, and his extra million that he bought was 90 some thousand dollars. The extra million that we bought was like $62,000. And the reason we only spent $62,000 is because of our performance. And, and, and uh, it is what it is. So. All that, all that being said, I, again, thank everybody, and, and uh, uh, you know, we, we, we do a good job, and, and, and that's, I uh, thank everybody for placing themselves and doing things right, and, and uh, I'll say it, I'll say it again, I've said it before, when you cheat, and you, and you cheat, and you don't do things right, you can apply this to anything in life, a matter of time, you get greedy. Yeah. You keep cheating. And then what happens? You get caught. It's just a matter of time before you get caught. So just continue to do things right, and, and that's all I ask. Uh, we're going to have Smith System training. Steve's going to sometime here this, this, this summer. Okay. There's probably three or four guys we're going to do a Smith System training down here. We are going to do a health, health fair, too at some point. Melissa's organizing that. Uh, our health is the best thing we all got going for us. None of us have anything greater than our health. Without our health, Indeed. we don't have a whole lot going. So it's important that we get physicals and, and, and we do these things that we talk about doing for your own well-being. And, and uh, so we're going to have a health fair and I uh, encourage everybody to attend and participate. And we also are going to do a having a 401k. Uh, Eric's going to come down, who manages all of our 401k money. Uh, he's going to come down and make a presentation. And, and those of you who are in it, you know, he'll he'll uh, you have, you'll have an opportunity to talk with him individually. And I can tell you this: the the the, the 401k is performing really well. Yeah, yeah. It took a dip there at the end of last year, but it, I think we've recovered, and, and everybody's up ahead of the game. I'm no investment advisor, believe me, but I just know overall, you know, the, the program and the guys we have in place that are managing it, it's doing very well. And those guys who are in it, it's an opportunity for you to come and, and uh, you know, and uh, hear about it and, and uh, you know, participate. And I'm going to encourage you to do so. Uh, and that's all I have. Thank you, Roger. Roger. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, is there anybody that has not signed in? Even office people. It's important you sign in so you are here. You got a quiz in your hands. While I'm talking, you can do this quiz, then we're going to go over it quickly. So there was one other thing I thought of that was a point of confusion on the ELD, AOBR. So you accept your loads in messaging. Messaging's a five gallon pail. Now you must put them in on the load tab in hours of service. Why? Because the government said, hey, back in the old days on paper logs, we had to put shipper and commodity or a bill of lading number. A pro number is acceptable as a bill of lading number, okay? So they said it can no longer be done through messaging. It's got to be on your log. But it's important for you guys to know, along with uh, Lee working here and the whole Jeremy thing that Roger mentioned, you got to accept your load in messaging. You got to accept your load. You got to arrive at the shipper, depart from the shipper, arrive at your stops, depart from your stops. There's no point in us having all this expensive software if we don't use it. And what it does is if you put everything in correctly in accepting your loads and delivering your loads, it will automatically send you the next load that you have in the system. So please ex uh, arrive and depart yourself correctly. As far as the load tab in hours of service, where it says load ID, goes your pro number, and then your trailer number. There's all those start and end times and all that stuff in there. I'm going to suggest at this point, and I might change my mind later, don't put that in, right? Don't go to the cop shop with a stolen car, right? <laughs> don't, don't put a whole bunch of stuff in there you don't want somebody looking at. Just put your pro number and your trailer number in on the load tab and hours of service. And then over in messaging, which affects our dispatch software, put the correct information in there. All the trailer numbers, your pro number, and your weight in there. That's what was required before, that's still required now. So they're two separate things, they're two five gallon pails. So you can keep working on that quiz you got there and we're gonna do a driver of the quarter for you new guys. Every quarter there's a driver of the quarter. Um, and if you're driver of the quarter at some point you're during the year, you could be eligible for driver of the year. Driver of the year gets $2,000 from Roger. Um, <clears throat> driver of the quarter, we get you a small gift $50 and a plaque to show our appreciation. <coughs> so the driver of the, the year this year was James Nichols, a driver in Springfield, Ohio. We had to, in a crunch, basically overnight, miraculously pr produce about six, seven guys to haul permit loads. You know, 90 grand on the deck. So that was, we had to pull out all our stops. Jim really did go above and beyond the cause. Um, there is a lot of people here that do that train and we appreciate it. So for you new guys, what goes into selecting the driver of the quarter of the year is all the terminal manager, uh, managers talk about it. And we call out and ask some drivers that work with you. So your peers have voted that you did went above and beyond the call and did a pretty good job. So for driver of the quarter, for quarter four for 2018, I'd like a big round of applause and him to come up, Kevin Green. Light? Flat? Card? Roger, you want to take an opportunity photo for us? Sure. We always forget to do that. You should do a selfie. <laughs> <laughs> no. You guys look like criminals. Good looking. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Nice job. All right. Looks like I missed 940, but I did work that break in it. And the only reason you guys got a break is because. Kevin White asked me to do it for you because I, I just drive on. That's how I work, so I thought I'd give you a break. And I'm going to try to do that in the future, so if you remind me of that. Okay, if you got one wrong, just put an X on it. Um, so the first part of the quiz is you can see that a lot of these questions have multiple answers to them. How many of those should you circle? How did it multiple? Fail. Oh, come on. Winner. 
<laughs> There's no teacher-like experience, right, Carnell? Right. Carnell oh, graduated man. from driving school the year I was born. I like to remember that. Keeps me in check. <laughs> okay. And I drove three million miles, so how old does that make Carnell? That's the math equation for the day. We won't even go there today. Okay, up here at the top it says circle all that apply. Think before you step. Okay, pay attention to what's going on around you. Don't cut your hands and legs. Don't step off the trailer. Please, be careful. That's my number one goal is to get you home every day. Number one, what is the most critical time in an accident scene? A. A. Number two, that should say, what does following my instructions in the first seven minutes allow us to do? I like to throw a typo in just for excitement. A. 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 It's all of them. All of them. Process the claim faster, recover our money, repair our or your vehicle faster, and eliminate the loss of revenue when the truck is not working. Number three, what are the consequences for failing to report an accident or injury? A and B. A, you, you're, you're gone. Number four, what paperwork should you turn in with each load so you and the company get paid? C, all the paperwork. Scale tickets are super important, guys. A lot of shippers pay us the tarping fees based on the scale ticket. So don't chuck those. All the paperwork you get, turn it in. We don't get paid, you don't get paid. Number five, circle all the proper PPE. So I'm going to say the ones that were not. Rolling Stone t-shirts, a NASCAR baseball hat, sunglasses, and flip-flops are not acceptable. Okay? That was a special. You know what that was? See, what kind of question is that? That's good. That's a Richie Hawthorne question right there. Gotcha. Good job. <laughs> Number six, when is it okay to ride on the outside of any vehicle, Randleman? Never. 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 Number seven, whose responsibility is it to get information and pictures to safety? Driver. Safety. Driver. Driver. The driver. Well, I can't do it for you. Talk Number eight, off. when is it okay to talk on the phone as a professional driver? Never. Never. Never or when you are not driving. I'll give you A or D. In emergency or when you're not driving, but never is the best possible scenario. Yes. Hopefully we don't have emergencies, right? And then I'd go with never. Yes. So <coughs> for you new guys, before you run away, if you don't come to safety meetings, you don't get your safety bonus. If you miss a safety meeting, you're supposed to call me in advance to get excused, and I will post the video on Google Analytics for you to watch. No meeting, no bonus. The reason we're doing quizzes is to make sure that I'm doing my job and to satisfy the federal government. So, everyone assigned the sheet, correct? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Please leave your quizzes up here on my laptop for me. The five guys that don't know how to edit logs, meet me up here and I'll fix it. Thank you. Yep. Just throw them right there. Yeah. I might have one, I might not. I don't know. I don't know if I got